and can really answer some of the questions that that we all have, um, speaking not just as elected officials and, and town officials, um, but as, as parents, as residents, as moms, um, and we're wondering, is it okay to go out and get your hair cut? Can I go have dinner? Um, can I go to a barbecue in a backyard with friends of mine? Can I think about summer vacation or camp? So these are some of the questions that Dr. Spice Handler will be able to help us navigate as well. We are really thrilled with these panelists that we've been able to line up today. Dawn, thank you so much um, in your role uh, with the Chamber for helping us to find these panelists. And I'm gonna stop talking because we've really got some experts with us today. So uh, Dr. Ambler, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Well, thank you. So good morning. And I think what's different about this because of course the health department is in the business of controlling and minimizing communicable disease. This is what we do every day, all year long. It's our bread and meat and potatoes for the health department. But how is COVID different from them from dealing with influenza or TB or any one of a number of other communicable diseases? And the real difference is that in the infectious disease manual, there's a blank page or there's been a blank page there that has COVID-19 written on it. And, to, and over the last four months, we've been filling in those blanks and answering all the questions about really what is this virus? How does it impact people? How do you treat it? How do you manage it? How do you prevent it? And so most of the time in public health, when we're dealing with an infectious disease, we know the natural course of the disease. We know how long the incubation period is. We know what symptoms you have. We know how it's spread. We know how we can stop it. Unfortunately, with COVID-19, we didn't know any of that when this started. And over the last three or four months, we've learned a tremendous amount. And now we have a, a lot of the answers. We don't have all of the answers, but we certainly know a lot more than we knew in March when we had our first case of COVID in Westchester. So, what do we know now? We know that the incubation period is somewhere between five and about 14 days, really probably 12, but we give 14 as a little added cushion. Uh, we know that it's primarily spread from people who may or may not have symptoms to other people that they are in close and prolonged contact with. So less than six feet for more than 10 minutes. And certainly if you're in an enclosed space for more than an hour, it puts you at risk. We, we now know that children can have serious complications. Initially, we thought they were Scott getting off scot-free. Now we know that's not necessarily the case. It's not common, but there are rare complications in children called multi-system inflammatory syndrome. And there have been children who have actually died of COVID, even though it is rare, as I said. We now know that the people who are greatest at risk for having a bad outcome, such as death, is actually individuals who are over 60 who have underlying medical conditions um, and that puts them at greater risk. And certainly individuals who are in nursing homes have been uh, have had a lot of impact in, in those facilities. So those are the kinds of things that we know. And we started out in March with one case in the New Rochelle area. And our job was to find out everything we could about that case find out who they might have potentially have exposed and try to put those people into quarantines. Quarantine is a legal term, basically means that you've been exposed to a disease and you may or may not have symptoms, but you could be incubating and you could develop that disease. So in the case of COVID, it meant that these people were told, stay home, stay in your home, don't expose anybody else for 14 days. And if you get symptoms, let us know and we'll send somebody to test you. We were actually going in to people's homes and doing nasal swabs to test them for COVID. Once they were positive, once a person tested positive, then the order went from a quarantine order to an isolation order saying, you have the disease. You cannot be around other people because if you do, you could give them this disease. And so uh, how long they needed to stay in quarantine is basically 10 days. Three, three of those 10, the last three of those 10 days, they, they cannot have fever without using any kind of medication. 
and they have to have improvement of their symptoms. And the only difference to that is people who will work in a nursing home. And for them, they must get a negative positive PCR test before they can return to work. Asymptomatic people, it's 10 days from the date that they tested positive. Um, so we have, we put these measures into place and then we tried to find the contacts and as I said, get them into quarantine. The real problem was that all at once we started getting hundreds and hundreds of cases of positive individuals. And as you can imagine, it was very difficult for us uh, to be able to manage that. So we dealt with it largely by, pro by providing education to the public. And I had people like Pete DeLucia out there dealing with facilities. Um, the governor came in, shut things down, uh, and our numbers started to, to uh, decrease. So now we're down to, we're seeing about 30 positives a day, 30 to 40 positives a day. Um, they have actually, the state has actually went in and did incident uh, uh, testing. So they go into um, a grocery store and they test the first 200 people who are willing to be tested. And in doing that, uh, at the height of it, we were someplace between 14 and 16% of the people who, um, who were tested were coming back positive. Now we're about 1%. So we're doing substantially better. So what is the game plan going forward? The game plan going forward is we're still investigating everybody who tests positive. We're trying to call them, trying to have a conversation with them to find out where did they get this disease and who could they have given it to? And we have hired an army of contact tracers, individuals who then get on the phone, call these people. So if you get a call and it says New York State contact tracer on your caller ID, please pick up the phone because somebody from the health department is trying to get reach you to give you some very important information about your health. And that's probably that you had an exposure and that you may need to quarantine yourself or that you might need to get tested. Um, so that's very important. So we're reaching out to everyone we know that's had an exposure. We're asking those people to quarantine themselves. We're asking them about any symptoms they have. And if appropriate, we're telling them to get tested. And that's how we get this disease to go away in our area. We have to be very diligent on this. And in addition to that, we have to open smartly. And opening smartly is where Peter DeLucia comes into play because we've had you know, schools closed, camps closed, swimming pools closed, everything's closed. So now as everything opens, how do we do this in a way that keeps us all safe? And so you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is the mass and those are very important. And I see, still see people walking around with no masks. And I will tell you that I think it's very, very important. When this all started, we were telling people, because again, remember, we didn't know everything we know now. So initially we were telling people, oh, you don't need to wear the mask. Only healthcare providers need to wear masks and they need to wear N95 masks. And N95 masks protects me, the wearer, from everybody else. But then we realized that a lot of this is, you know, this virus is heavy. It doesn't go very far. It goes, may go about six feet out, but then people were being exposed and getting the disease from others. So when you wear a mask, a surgical mask, a cloth mask, you protect everyone else from you. And that's what we need people to do is wear a mask and do social distancing. So at least six feet. And it isn't just the distance. It's also the amount of time that you are exposed. So if you're in an enclosed room with a lot of people, don't stay there very long. You need to leave. Less than 10 minutes is a good time. Um, so now I'm going to turn this over to Pete, and he can talk about how facilities are going to make it safe for you to go shopping, for you to go to the grocery store, go buy a new dress, get a pair of shoes, do whatever it is you need to do in the public in a safe manner. Pete? Thanks, Dr. Rambler. I think... Uh... One of the extremely important things we want to focus on all the time is that masking that Dr. Amler just mentioned it, how important for masking to work, everybody has to wear the mask because you're protecting other people from you. It's not like when we have our emergency workers or my team are going into certain hot zones where we have to wear our N95s. That's why it's very, very important that whether it's just the good old fashioned surgical mask that you can, you can get a hold of or 
it's fine. The cloth fabric mask, masks that people are making, or I've got a really cool one that Bauer Hockey made, so I feel like I'm cool when I'm wearing it, um, you know, and you look fashionable, but it's important to wear that mask. And what's happening is you're hearing all the things every day the governor has his press announcement, and you're hearing about new things that are going to be open to try to have, you know, stimulate stimulate the, stimulate the businesses from, you know, being able to open and stimulate the economy and also allow us to, you know, move a little more freely around the county, but we want to do that safely. So there's restrictions that are put in place for a reason so that we can continue to move forward without seeing our case numbers go up with with being able to be, you know, sensitive to those people who want to be out and about uh, as much as or as limited as possible, it might be immunocompromised. So we have to make sure we follow those directives. And that's where my division comes into play as these uh, businesses can reopen, whether it is a, a hair salon or a barbershop or a restaurant or even a children's camp that are going to the children's camp is going to be opening later in a the month. There are certain restrictions and things you have to get used to doing. I, I, I don't like using the term the new normal because I don't want it to be normal forever. But for now, it is the new normal to be able to operate and, and be able to do and enjoy these things and summer activities that are happening. Because we know as the weather gets warmer, no matter what, people are going to be migrating outside. They're going to want to do things. So we rather, as far as my division, we rather look at it where there's sensible regulations in place that people can follow to be able to have a good time. So first and foremost, we see that outdoor dining has been uh, put into play uh, about a week ago or so now. We've been able to have outdoor dining. So basically what that means is on top of what we've been used to, to the uh, just takeout and delivery service where you're, you're basically going to that window for takeout or you're just, you know, the restaurants have set a way up where you can, you can you know, order and they'll bring it out to you to your car. Now they can have seating outdoors. And the way that was put into play was keeping that six foot distancing. So all your tables and the backs of the chairs, you have to be six feet apart so that when a group is at, that, at the table dining, you don't have to wear your mask because obviously how are you going to be able to eat with having your mask on? That would defeat the purpose if we cut a hole in it. So you can sit there. They came up with the number of 10. So you could have 10 unrelated parties dining out together. Uh, we still recommend, you know, it should be, you know, people from your household and things like that. But if you do want to get together and you feel comfortable with the with your friends and family that have been also socially distancing and isolating where you want to go out and enjoy a meal, it's out, so outside. You could be at a table of 10. Remember, you have to have your masks with you because if you get up from that table and you want to go past other tables and go use the restroom, uh, you need to wear that mask. And that's one of the things that was put into play that the restaurants will have restrooms available if they normally do. If it's a restaurant that doesn't normally have bathrooms, they're not going to have them. But if they're required to have bathrooms because of their normal operation, those bathrooms will be open. And they have to have, they'll be cleaning them regularly. There's all those plate things that are put into play. The, uh, everybody that's working in the restaurant, the wait staff, the, the, the chef, everybody there is going to be properly masked and wear their mask. And you also have to comply with that masking when you go in there, um, other than when you're sitting at the table. Now, coming up next week on Tuesday, as long as all goes well, we're all in the mid Hudson re region here, indoor dining will, will start to, to, to be available at a 50% capacity. So that means if inside, typically uh, they, they have seating for, let's just say 50 people to make it easy math, they're down to, to 25 seats that they're allowed. And they might even have less, because uh, once again, it's going to be depending on how they can arrange their tables to accommodate for the social distancing so that when you and your family and your friends go there, you can be safe, you can be six foot from those other tables, but remember, still got to wear that mask when you go around and do your business there. Um, one of the things that we always recommend, and I'm going to even re recommend it more stringently here during COVID, is hand washing. So when you go out to eat at one of these restaurants, you really want to make sure you do frequent hand washing. So you maybe get to the restaurant, you sit down at your outdoor table, you handle the man menu. Many of them are using just paper menus now, which is great. We've seen that paper menus really don't hold many types of bacteria or viruses on them and they can recycle them and, and, and have new menus every day or on a, on a frequent basis. But still, after you handle the menu, after you, you, know, you touch your seat and things like that, even though they've been sanitized, before your food comes out, I'd recommend make that visit to the bathroom, thoroughly wash your hands, uh, make sure if there's paper towels available, I always recommend using paper towels over the 
high high force or any of those type of hand dryers because I don't know anybody that ever stays there long enough to keep their hands underneath there to dry them. And inadvertently, you're wiping them on your on your shirt, you're wiping them on your pants, you've reinfected your hands. That's a problem. So I'd use those paper towels, use them to shut off the faucet, use them to open the door if possible, toss them in the garbage, go back, and then take your mask off and enjoy your meal. Um, we also recommend all the time, you know, be conscientious of, of touching your face. You shouldn't be touching your face. That's that hand-to-face contact where potentially there could be a transmission of the bacteria or, or a virus. Also, I know a lot of people are very interested in wearing plastic gloves when they go out, rubber gloves, plastic gloves, when they go out to the restaurant or when they go shopping and all that. Remember, just because you have gloves on, all right, that may be protecting your hands, but now the gloves are getting, getting dirty and picking up whatever might be out there. So if you touch your face with gloved hands, you've defeated the purpose of wearing the gloves. So be very conscientious. Gloves aren't, you know, don't solve all problems in the world. Um, And if you do wear gloves at all, make sure if you're going to take them off, dispose of them properly. We're finding a lot of, we're getting complaints and finding a lot of of rubbish, whether it be masks and gloves and parking lots of restaurants and supermarkets and things like that. So be respectful and make sure you you, you dispose of those things safely. Um, So let's move on. Beaches have been open and pools are going to be open. We're issuing pool permits now. And once again, for the beaches and the pools, there are restrictions that those entities that decide to operate to allow the public to come there have to follow. And that's an enhanced cleaning schedule, social distancing. So don't be aggravated at the operator if at your local uh, favorite beach or pool to go to, they usually provided you with uh, nice chairs and things like that. They may decide not to do that because it might be too much for them to be cleaning those chairs after every person uh, that, that uses them. That's going to be something they're going to need to do. So some of them are deciding that you bring your own chairs. Some of them will have the chairs, but they might not be ready right away because after one party leaves them, they're going to have to clean them. You might not be able to get into your favorite pool every day or beach because there's going to be a capacity restriction. They're going to need to do that to be able to have the social distancing at those facilities. Right now, the rule of 10 is still in play there also. You could have a group of 10 people that come together and can stay together at a swimming pool or at at a beach. They could set up their blanket or chairs or whatever. And then from that group, people have to be a minimum of six feet away. When you're in that group at the beach or the pool, you do not need to be masked. But do you need to bring a mask to the pool or the beach? Absolutely. Because when you leave that group and you go to the bathroom or to go walk around, you need to have a mask on. If you're going into the water, you do not need to wear a mask. And I implore you, please do not wear a mask when you go swimming, because that's going to interfere with your breathing and could be definitely a hazard for drowning. So we're not looking to to wear a mask when we're swimming. When you see your lifeguards in the chairs and all watching you, they're not required to wear masks. And that's exactly why, because they have to run in and do a rescue. And, And so they have to function still as a normal lifeguard. Now, when the lifeguard is wandering to go to the bathroom or do something, as we've explained to the facilities, they need to have a mask and and have a mask with them so they can do that. So it's kind of, you know, you you have to look at this from the perspective of what's reality that to be able to function and, and, and be able to operate a facility like this and operate it safely. And you as a patron need to have that respect for the other patrons there and the facility to abide by their rules and, and be sensible when, when you're doing these things. Uh, children's camps, uh, uh, they announced that overnight camps will not operate in New York State this year. So that's off the table. But day camps were announced that they are going to be in operation. So we're working diligently uh, every day with the day camps that are deciding to open to go over the additional rules and regulations to be able to keep their counselors and their patrons, the campers, safe when going to day camp. So there will be Um, You know, once again, it's not going to be your typical day camp scenario. Be ready to be filling out forms every day for your child, uh, affirming that they're not ill. Be ready for the camps to take a temperature check of your child every day when you drop them off to make sure that they don't have a fever. Because, you know, look, while we understand everybody is very well intended, we also understand the reality that people sometimes have to go to work and maybe a uh, little little junior uh, is, is not feeling 100%, but you think they're fine, but then you get to camp. If they have a fever, they are not going to be allowed into camp, and you shouldn't even try to get them into camp if they have any symptoms. So that's going to be something that we're going to be following up on. The camp's going to follow up on. We're making an algorithm right now for the camp, whether or not who they have to contact for contact tracing, who has to be isolated, and things like that. If, in fact, someone was at camp for a period of time, 
that was ill and had COVID-like symptoms or actually tested positive for COVID, a counselor or a cancer, uh, camper. So that information be prepared. You're going to have to supply that to the camp because we need to know to protect those other campers and allow camp to operate this year in that fashion. So those are some of the things that are going to be happening. Now, your camper is the same thing. It's going to be groups of 10. Uh, that doesn't include the counselors, but they're going to be static groups of 10. So your group of 10 campers it will be the same 10 campers for that whole period of camp. If it's a week-long camp, a two-week session, whatever it might be, and the counselors with them, same thing. They're static to that group. If the camp has swimming, be prepared because your child will be uh, paired this year uh, in that group much more to swim ability than to who is my friend and not my friend because to be able to have the swimming work, uh, you need to have the swimmer's uh, ability assessed, whether they can swim or they can't swim. doesn't matter in the past if you're a guppy, you're a shark, uh, you're a barracuda. Uh, we basically say, you know, do they sink or do they swim? Simple as that. That's what we need to know. Uh, and it, it, it's, it, it's the truth because we, we want to make sure if you cannot swim, you are limited to that chest deep water. So if you've got a group of 10, that group of 10 can only be in that chest deep water. Back in the Previous last year and, and under normal camping scenarios, when you get to the waterfront, they can repair their buddies. So if you have certain swim abilities, they can do that. Right now, remember, we're not having these other groups of 10, you know, basically play or integrate in any way, shape, or form. So we keep that static group of 10 safe for the period of camp. It's going to be a swimming group or a non-swimmer group is the way we, we've explained it to the camps to be able to do that. So for everybody's safety, the kids in that group, and for the, uh, especially the aquatic safety, which is one of the paramount things we, we inspect and we keep an eye on during the season to make sure your children are safe at camp. Um, so those are just some of the little things. There's a lot of other procedures that are in place for the camps. But remember, for those of you that have kids that are going to be sending them to camp, make sure vaccination records, just like always. So if you're able to send your kid to camp, as one of my disease control docs mentioned, you're able to go to the doctor and make sure your vaccination records are up to date. So anybody that has a kid, a child that was at the point of needing an update or a new vaccination, make sure you've, you've gotten them. Make sure you have those forms filled out so we have our vaccination records ready for camp. Uh, and then be ready to be filling out that daily health check form that you're going to have to do. We're trying to produce something for the camps that's universal for Westchester so it's easy. The parents can pre-fill it out. But the camps are going to be doing that temperature check for the campers before they go in. And just so you know, for your peace of mind, they're doing it for the counselors also making sure that the counselors are doing the same thing. So we know that everybody that's going to be watching and handling your kids is, you know, as to the best ability possible, uh, we're trying to make it as safe as possible and, and ensure that uh, we have a happy and, and fun summer. Um, I speak quickly. I think I went over a lot. I think I touched a lot of things for those businesses that are on the call. Always remember, uh, you should have it as a favorite in your on your web browser, that New York Forward website and the Empire State Development links and all of those things, because every day uh, things could change and there's updates and things. So keep an eye on that. So you know what phase you're in, you know what essential businesses are there, you know what, what, what things you can do. Um, if you're a barbershop or a hair salon, there's special guidance for you out there that talks about how to operate safely and how to, you know, have people call in for reservations, wait in the car, call in, hey, I'm here for my 1130 appointment. Can I come in yet? No, wait five minutes because I have to sanitize a chair or that, you know, that person isn't done yet. You know, you, know, you can't have people all stacked up and waiting in, in the barbershop or the hair salon anymore. And I, I just bring that out because we've gotten complaints about that. Um, and realize people are out there watching what everybody is doing right now. And we're, we're, our phone rings off the hook every day with complaints that are valid and that are not valid because people are a little confused about the guidance and we try to sort that out for everybody. But check those websites out on a regular basis. They're very important. We are the Mid-Hudson region. Uh, so the Empire State Development does have a Mid-Hudson office. It's right there on the website. You can give them a call. Uh, they're very useful also to, to let you know if you have any questions of of where we are, because there are there are some guidance tools on the website, um, but sometimes it's confusing. When you look at those guidance tools on the website for Empire State Development, I forget the exact name. There's a, a business ID number that you can look up. I, I say it's very important to look up that ID number for your business so you have that, because if you just type in hair salon or you just type in something else, sometimes you get the wrong information. 
there is a, a, an ID associated to all different types of businesses. And it's great to get that ID number. It helps you go through that website and, and learn more. Um, that's, that's what I think I, I, could, I could keep talking for two hours if you'd like me to, but I think it's better just to go with questions um, if you have any or move on to, uh, you know, to, to whatever business is, is next on the agenda. But thank you. Thank you, Peter. We appreciate it. And thank you, Dr. Amler, as well. I know that the two of you had said you had about 30, 35, 40 minutes total. Um, and I also want to give Dr. Spice Handler a chance to jump in. We did have a couple of questions come in over chat, though, that are operational questions. So I'll save some of the um, some of the sort of more medical questions uh, for Dr. Spice Handler when she when she presents in a moment. But for some of these operational questions, I just wanted to, while we have you, the two of you on the phone um, or, or on this webinar, uh, just direct those towards you. So we had a question come in about pools specifically. And, and you know, I want to thank you, Peter, for the work that your team did to help um, expedite some of the, the permits that we needed in order for um, some of the private pool clubs here in, in Newcastle to be able to open. Um, but the question is whether we have any um, idea when the state might be able to release the, the sort of guidelines, statewide guidelines that would govern uh, pools reopening. So we know there are statewide guidelines on beaches. Um, are we anticipating something similar to be done? They are out. The statewide guidelines are out. We've sent them to all of our permitted pools in uh, Westchester County, whether they're municipal or, or uh, you know, I don't like using private. You make, you think of backyard pools. We don't permit backyard pools, but the other private pools are condos and co-ops and beach clubs and all that. So we've sent that guidance out. If you are on this call and you're an operator of one of these facilities and you haven't received it for some reason, please let me know. Uh, my email is Peter Peter David four. That's PPD four, the number four at WestchesterGov.com. You can shoot me an email and I'll make sure uh, that gets to the appropriate person and we get you that guidance. Because as of now, uh, we've been issuing per pool permits on a daily basis. The procedure is we've got everybody that originally submitted their application for an outdoor pool. Um, we held everything waiting for this guidance. Once you look at this guidance, you fill out the same New York forward safety plan uh, that you fill out for any business, but under the section of how you're gonna, uh, you know, basically confirm with the guidelines, you put your new safety plan addendum in there explaining on how you're going to hit all those points in the guidelines to make sure you operate safely. You submit that back to us. You keep a copy on site for yourself, but you send it to the email that we have in our guideline uh, protocol that we sent out. We do a quick review of it. And as long as you, you, hit, you hit the bases, we send you a copy of your permit and you're able to operate. And we're gonna be doing inspections throughout the summer at all our swimming facilities that are in operation to make sure they're complying and, and upholding to all of those items that are that are in there. And there's a blanket statement we're putting on our permit also that you're making sure that you're operating within the guidelines of anything new that's being that's put out from the governor's order in relation to, I think it's executive order 202 uh, or, or something along those lines. So um, it, they are out there, the guidance is there and uh, we're opening pools. So that, that's where we are. I think that kind of covers that. And that's the same for it did say the mandate for lakes and beaches. The only difference in the pool guidance was it didn't clearly, uh, and we're going over it, it didn't say and say you had to do 50% capacity. It just says you have to do social distancing where the beach guideline had that 50% capacity in. But I know a lot of the pools are gonna go with that capacity because there's no way they can meet those social distancing requirements with having full capacity. I'm actually going to turn it over to Don Danker Rosen, who had a couple of questions come in over email that are specifically for Dr. Amler, and then we'll let you guys go. Thank you for your time. Um, hi. Um, this question came in that that I think would be specifically for you. Um, how enhanced is the risk for both the hairstylist and consequently? for his immediate family whose parents are over 65. What is the monitoring and frequency thereof that will be done to hair and nail salons to make sure both required and best practices are followed and in particular for those salons that cater to children where mass compliance might be challenging because of their age? And actually that's not the local health department that would be doing that, um, but um, 
the issue around an older parent, I think that's universal. It doesn't matter if you're working in a hair salon or where you're working. You do want to be certain that you are doing everything possible to keep yourself from getting COVID. So wearing a mask, doing social distancing, hand sanitizing, keeping your hands out of your face. Uh, if someone appears to be ill, they don't need to be in your facility. And, you know, if you feel that you can't manage that, then social distancing from parent who is over 65 and has underlying medical conditions may be necessary. And I would suggest that you have a con that you have your parent have a conversation with their doctor around what their risk is and what kind of measures they should take. Yeah, I'm going to jump in here. As Dr. Ambler said, it's interesting the way the enforcement is laid out uh, and the guidance that's out there. We will handle uh, calling a hair salon, giving them some advice and all, but the actual enforcement uh, right now for non-health department permitted facilities like restaurants and beaches and country clubs and things like that is the local code enforcement officer, which is generally the building department. So the building department has been tasked with when there's a, 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 a legitimate complaint, uh, a lot of times they'll have us call and consult, but they will be going out to the facility asking to see that safety plan. Because if you're a barbershop or a salon, you're required to have that New York forward safety plan that you submitted to them and you have it on site so that when someone comes out, they can review it, which would be the code enforcement officer. We assist, we do help, uh, but we're, we're not as, as deeply involved at this point. Some parts of the state they've been having, uh, the health department get involved a little bit more, but the way it's been dictated through the ordinances is it's the code enforcement officer, which is the building inspector for that municipality. All right, well, listen, we've really enjoyed your time. Thank you so much for inviting us and uh, we look forward to doing it again. Thank you. Thank this you. Was great. Thank, Thank you, you both. so much. Take care, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you so much. So everybody else, don't leave the call because I'm as excited about part two as I was about part one of this call. Um, we have Dr. Deborah Spice-Handler with us from Northwell Health. Um, and she's going to be able to really answer in more detail, actually, some of these questions that we all have about how do we make um, not just choices uh, that are sort of driven by the government with regard to what can open when, but how do we make individual choices as well? How do we weigh risks and how do we take in the, the data and the science that's out there um, and, and determine for ourselves when we feel comfortable doing certain things? So Dr. Spice Handler, thank you so much for being on the line with us and thank you for waiting and we're really excited to hear from you. Thank you. So I've been the go-to person for both patients and friends about what is safe. I get calls every day, text messages. And as um, was already said, we don't know what the future will bring. We do know that the infection rate has gone way down in our area, in our community. Right now at the hospital, we are seeing very, very few admissions for new COVID cases from the community, which is good news. Um, and the other good news is that we have available testing now for anyone who wants a test. And I thought I would take a second to explain the tests because it's a bit confusing, I think, to people who are not medical. Um, so we have two tests right now for COVID. Um, they're produced by various companies, but the two types of tests are the, um, the screening test for whether you have active COVID, which is the test we all know about. It's the nose test where someone puts something up into your nose and then does a swab and test for COVID. And that is to see if you actually are currently carrying COVID and are able to transmit. Um, and the second test is the antibody test. So if someone has symptoms, we want the to do the COVID PCR test, it's called, to see if you in fact have COVID and if you need to be isolated as um, was already said. Um, we have seen a marked decline in positive tests for the PCR in our community, which is a good thing. Um, the other test is the antibody test. And what the antibody test tells us is if you've ever had COVID in the recent past. We don't know if it confers immunity long-term. We do know that it tells us whether you have been exposed or had it 
And if you had symptoms a month or two ago and weren't able to get the nose test at the time, it's a way for you to find out whether that cold that you had, or if you thought you had COVID, you in fact had COVID. Um, it's now available to everybody. At first it was just for um, people in nursing homes or patients coming into the hospital, but now anybody who wants to get a test can get a test is my understanding. I know that um, Northwell is doing it at um, Chappaqua Crossing. Um, the Mount Kisco group is doing it. Um, I'm not sure where in Westchester County, otherwise if they're doing it in some of the other um, centers, urgent cares are doing it. Um, so it, it's worth doing to know where your status is, but we should not forget to wear masks and to take all the precautions that were already mentioned. I can't tell you how many times a day I touch my face. I wasn't even aware of it. So just to go over the mask, the mask protects someone else, doesn't protect you necessarily unless you're wearing it N95. But it does protect you somehow because if you're wearing a mask and you have a habit of touching your face, at least if your hands aren't clean, you haven't put it at your nose or your mouth. And that's really very important. Um, the mask is also important not to give it to someone else. Um, and people ask me all the time, well, when I'm walking outdoors, should I be wearing a mask? It depends how close you are to other people. You know, the rule is six feet, but if someone is sweating and running and dripping, it's, it's a little bit long, uh, further apart. So just to be aware of what kind of exercise you're doing when you're outside, and if you're at risk to transmitting or to actually getting exposed to COVID. Um, the questions I get most frequently are, um, can I go to the hairdresser? Well, I have to say that I went to the hairdresser last week and it was perfectly fine. I was had my temperature taken. I was asked a question, have I been exposed to COVID? Well, the fact is that I have because I work at the hospital, but in fact, every one of us has been exposed to COVID, whether we knew it or not, we probably have somehow been in contact. So I think it's more important these questions and that they have a record of who you are in case someone does get COVID so they can do the contact tracing. But my hairdresser wore a shield and I wore my mask and there was a plastic bag and it was fine. And I didn't feel at all uncomfortable. And if it was an infectious disease doctor, I didn't feel uncomfortable, you shouldn't feel uncomfortable. Um, outdoor dining, I have personally not done that yet, but uh, lots of people have done it. I think that it's okay as long as they maintain distance. I've seen pictures in Manhattan and New York of the, the youth at the bars and they were not social distancing and that's not acceptable. So as long as you have a appropriate distance and that the people at your table are people in your circle of what we call the COVID circle that you allow uh, certain family members that you've had contact with and you're not um, you know what their um, exposures have been and you're aware that they have little risk as you do. Um, I still am concerned about people with underlying disease um, being exposed, as it was already mentioned, they're at much higher risk. And I would caution probably that if you have an underlying disease, you should be a little more cautious and wait a little bit before you do some of these more um, activities that might expose you until we really see that two weeks from when we opened up, we don't have an increase in cases and we're about hitting that point now. But remember with COVID, as was already said, the incubation period is up to almost 14 days. So when we had protests two weeks ago, we're still trying to see if there's been an increase in cases and we don't know the answer to that yet. Um, other questions that people ask me, can I have someone come into my house and fix something, repair something, clean my house? I, my philosophy on that is as long as the person is wearing mask and then while they're cleaning gloves because they're touching your surfaces. But after they leave, if you need someone to clean, then I take a Clorox wipe and wipe down your doorknobs or areas that you might touch um, frequently. But basically if they're using cleaning supplies to clean, they are cleaning you know, with things that you would clean with. And basically they are killing the COVID with the Clorox or the uh, cleaning supplies. Repair people, I've had a couple of repair people come into my house. They wore masks and they wore gloves. I wore a mask also when I interacted with them, even though it was my own house. And um, I think that's important that we still keep our um, social distancing. We wear masks, we wash hands. We 
I would add one more thing when you go to the restaurant. I know he said, that, go to the bathroom and wash your hands. I, if you had a Purell bottle, would keep the Purell bottle with me so that um, you can use your Purell right then and there. You don't have to get up, leave the table. If you have access, I saw on Amazon now, you can get Purell again. So everybody can have hand sanitizer. It doesn't have to be Purell, just hand sanitizer. And that's very important. Um, with children and um, playing together, um, it's okay if you know who you're, the social circle you're in, the same precautions. Um, basically, if, if your friend's children have been socially isolated and your children have been socially isolated and you wanna have a one-on-one uh, -on -one play date, it's probably okay now. But you know, still the same kind of precautions because children don't know how to wash their hands and keep themselves clean. Um, so you just have to depend on the child. I love the story, what my grandson told me, he's almost four. And the story was this, he lives in Manhattan and they went to Central Park and a child came close to him and he said, don't come near me, I have a virus and you could catch it, you know. He didn't quite understand, but at least he had the concept, don't come near me. So I think we're easing up on that a little bit with children and of course they're opening camp and there's gonna be interaction. So I just think that we have to closely monitor what happens in the next several weeks. Um, people ask me all the time, what do you think? Are we going to have another rise in the fall? Well, as you can see, the good news about New York is that we did shut down. We did lower the level of infection quite a bit so that when we open up, we have a lower level of infection than, say, a place like Arizona, where it never um, it never lowered. They, they op reopened while their infection rate was still rising. So it's a slightly different scenario. Our infection rate had dropped quite a bit and our bed capacity in the hospitals has improved and the patients getting into the hospital has dropped. Well, in other states where we're hearing on the news about the big rise once they reopen, it's because they never actually lowered their rates to begin with. That doesn't rule out that we might have a rise in our rates tick up again as more people go out and get exposed. But I think that that is the difference between our state and some other states right now. Um, I think um, it, it was covered about stores and going into stores and shops. I mean, I think that the real important thing is try to keep yourself healthy as possible. If you have any signs and symptoms of um, a cold respiratory, stay in your house. Oh, one more thing I wanted to cover is going to the doctor. It's very important that you resume your medical care. I have seen over the last several weeks many patients coming into the hospital with other infections that have been staying at home and thought it might be COVID and they had serious infections or treatable infections or in other fields like heart disease and diabetes, they weren't being managed because they were afraid to go to the doctor. Your doctors are the safest place you can be right now. All the doctor's offices are taking precautions. Patients are wearing masks. They're keeping you outside and calling you in when it's your time for your appointment. All the staff is wearing PPE, and we have found that PPE, that's protective gear, really works. We've, since the um, shutdown and that we were aware of the virus, there have really been very few cases in healthcare workers who've taken and worn appropriate PPE once they, you know, the, expo the initial exposure period back in March was over. So I think that people should really go back to the doctor. Um, the dentist also, um, they have now have a whole new process of how they handle dental offices, but it's important that you have good dental health and resume your dental care in addition, um, because you don't want to, you know, avoid COVID and get something else that you missed because you didn't go and keep up with your medical appointments and with children, almost definitely vaccinations, because we don't want to see a rise in measles or other communicable diseases because the children didn't get vaccines. Um, last thought is vaccines. I get a lot of questions about what's going on with vaccines. Um, we don't have a vaccine yet. And we might have one by the end of the year from all the studies that we're reading right now, but we don't know that. And we don't know if the vaccine's going to um, make it that you don't get it ever, like certain vaccines where you never get the illness, like smallpox once you're vaccinated, or it's gonna be more like a flu vaccine year to year. So we just don't know what's going to happen come on that note. So I think we do have to start to resume our lives because it's quite a bit off to get a vaccine right now, but with all of these precautions. And um, 
we have an entered phase three in our area, which is opening up indoor dining, nail salons, et cetera. So let's see how we manage with phase two before we talk about phase three, I think. I think that's it, unless there's something else that came through that someone has a question. But I am a mother and a grandmother. And um, I just wanna say that I have seen my grandchildren. Last week, I read the article in the Times that it's okay to hug my grandsons, so, but I didn't hug them because they live in Manhattan. I let them hug my legs, but I could, it, we do have social distancing visits. Uh, they haven't been in my house personally yet um, because they are exposed more than I am. My son is a doctor and works in the city and he's exposed, though he's been testing negative, but I'm still concerned. So, um, but if you're your family members have been socially distanced, it's probably fine to open up your circle to include your grandchildren and your family members. But we, a lot of grandparents haven't seen their grandchildren in two months. I think we're getting to that point that we can start to hug at least. Okay. And as a mom who took her daughter to visit her grandparents last week, I will tell you that the grandchildren want those hugs just as much as the grandparents <laughs> yes, do. They do. Thank he was so much much my kid so when I said, okay, to hug my leg. He said, okay. And I said, yes. My daughter cried when she got to hug her grandmother. It was, it was beautiful. Anyway, <laughs> enough about me. <laughs> um, that was really fantastic. We have had so many questions come in and I know we're, we're only got okay. a few minutes left with you. So I, um, we won't be able to get through them all. And I apologize in advance to everybody if we don't get to your question. Um, I did, there are a couple of things that, you know, while we have you here, there's a question that's come in about testing. Um, and some of the guidance has been a little bit, uh, you know, sort of unclear on this. So, you know, should we be taking advantage of the COVID test and getting, getting the test for the virus itself? Or if we don't have symptoms, should we instead be, be getting antibody tests at this point? Um, and do you recommend testing generally for people who, who are asymptomatic and, and feeling healthy? Right. So you don't need the PCR or the nose screen if you're asymptomatic unless your work requires you to have it before you go back to work. The antibody test is useful because a certain percentage of people have been exposed and it would be nice to know whether or not you have antibodies. We don't know if there's long-term protection, but we do think there is short-term protection. So it's not necessary. It's only if you want to know. Um, and if you had some illness earlier in the season in April and you're not sure, it would be okay to get the antibody test. It's a blood test. Um, you don't have to be fearful to go get the test like, oh, I don't want to get a test because I might get COVID. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and But I don't think you need the nose test unless you're symptomatic or it's required for you to return to work. Thank you for that. Um, we've had several questions that have come in with people who are, who are specifically concerned because they're immunocompromised. And if you have sort of additional guidance for those people, are there additional precautions they should be taking with regards to whether they should be seeing children, whether they should be going into a store, a pharmacy, et cetera, um, and whether they should be going back to work um, if they're, if they're you know, working indoors in, and yeah. particularly in someone's house. So my caution for immunocompromised um, people is to be a little more cautious. Let's wait and see what the reopening these next several weeks bring us, what happens with the virus as it rise when we reopen, because you are at greater risk. Um, if you wear masks and you go into the pharmacy and everybody else is wearing masks, it's probably okay. Um, there are still lots of shoppers at the supermarket. I personally have not gone back to the supermarket. I kind of like not going to the supermarket. I found out this is a great thing, Instacart. But in other words, I would be a little more cautious if you're immunocompromised. Um, I'm sure there are family members who could shop for you. I do think that when you open up your circles, like outdoor, di outdoor dining in your backyard with social distancing is probably okay. I wouldn't yet go into the restaurants until we see what the reopening brings us. Is there an increase? Because you should not be the people to take the risk to see if it's safe and we have a low level and we're not rising our um, cases. I think you can wait a little bit longer though. I know it's hard not to do those things. I still think it's a good idea. Staying healthy, but do keep up with your doctor appointments because you wouldn't want to miss being treated um, for your illnesses 
if you have conditions. That's the one thing I absolutely think you need to do. It's been two months. If you haven't been to the doctor, you need to go in. A couple of questions have come through about vacations. It's summer and we're all thinking about, do you would really like to be able to get away? Right. Um, so do you have I any know. guidance on flying or whether we should be taking vacations, staying in hotels, that kind of thing? So I know that airplanes have done the, you know, not filling up the seats and everyone's wearing masks. And, you know, right now, um, I wouldn't be flying to other parts of the country unless you need to, because we know that the infection rate is much higher in other mm -hmm. parts of our country. Um, if you need to go, to, that you must, you wear masks, uh, wipe down your seat, take the precautions you would take. But if it's not necessary to travel um, to places that the epidemic is higher and you have some underlying illness, definitely I would not get on the plane. Though they do say that the air filtering in the plane is is better and that it's a low risk, but still anywhere you go where you're in a confined area with other people is a risk. Um, I don't think a lot of the hotels are open. I, it's fine to go somewhere and rent a house and make sure the house is clean before you rent it. I don't know if hotels have opened generally. I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, and driving is, is fine. Um, but I think, you know, you'll have to check with the individual state what the recommendations. I heard just yesterday that to drive into the state of Maine, you have to show your COVID negative. And I didn't even hear that before. You actually have, some of the states have shut down and that way we'll have very few cases. So you just have to check with each state and what their, um, what their conditions are for you coming into their state. I don't, as long as you're with your own family circle and you're in a area, you know, a house rental or, um, isolated a bungalow or something it's probably okay i saw something on the internet about the camps that aren't opening up or opening up family camps with individual bunks for families that sounded like a good idea but you know you have to weigh your own risk and what if anyone has any underlying conditions i think that's really what we're looking at we have seen cases of COVID and people with no risk factors i don't want anybody to think that the only people who get COVID have underlying risk factors but the mortality is much higher in people who've had underlying diseases. I think we have time for maybe one more question. This, this one actually comes from a, a comment that Dr. Andler made at the top of the call, but it's a medical question. So I thought I would direct it towards you. She, she had made a comment that, you know, you maybe should not spend more than say 10 minutes in an enclosed environment if you can avoid that. Um, it, seems like that's a very hard thing to comply with when we think about going to go get a haircut. Mine takes longer than 10 minutes, yeah. um, you know, or, or being in a work environment where you're indoors for more than 10 minutes. Can you maybe clarify what your, yeah. your feelings are I think on that? He's talking about a very small space. Um, and if you're in a space with good ventilation and I mean, I have a friend who's an audiologist and she asked me about going back to work because she's in a small booth. I mean, I think in, in a very small area where there's very little circulation, probably not a good idea. But if you're in an open space, it's probably okay as long as you're wearing masks, you're staying socially distanced. But it is true that indoors is a higher risk if it's in the environment than outdoors. So the outdoor dining is one thing. We'll see what happens when we get indoor dining if there's a rise in a, a rate of infection. But I think that's what she's referring. I agree, I can't get my hair done in 10 minutes. And I personally spent over an hour in the hair salon and that was more than a week ago. So, um, so far so good, you know, so uh, personally. Thank you for that. Dawn, did we hit most of the, most of the questions? Did you have any um, burning questions before we? No, I, I think um, Dr. Spice Handler, you were really, interesting um, and really helpful. You actually answered many of my questions, specifically one, so I really appreciate it. Um, okay, somebody asked about N95 masks I see in the questions. I just wanna comment on that real quickly. So N95s do prevent you from getting the disease. You know, that is one kind of mask that if you wear it, we were talking about how N regular masks prevent other people, but not you. But if you've ever worn an N95, it's very difficult to wear for a prolonged period of time. You have to really commend your healthcare workers who wear it all day because it's very hard to wear one. So I wouldn't routinely wear an N95 unless you think you're in a very high risk situation. 
And is that when, when they're labeled K and 95? Yeah, I don't know B? what that means. I'm looking at the question. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I wasn't sure either. I do actually, because I ordered them. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say I'm one of those people who um, stockpiles a lot of stuff. So um, the KN95, I believe, is, the, is, the chi is um, from China, which was because we were out of N95, it was okayed for a mm -hmm. year. So it's, um, it's become a standard um, because we've lacked um, inventory for N95. Okay. Well, Dr. Spicehandler, thank you so much for joining us. I don't want to take any more of your time. I know you've got Forward to me any questions that didn't get answered that come down. I'm happy. Thank to you answer. so much. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Dawn, did you want to close? Yes, I, I did. Um, I want to thank everybody. Um, and um, I wanted to um, also reach out. Um, we're thinking of for next week, having a kind of debrief um, on the reopening. We've gone through phase two, um, phase one, phase two, going into phase three. And I'd love to um, uh, solicit um, uh, speakers and panelists from businesses and also from the community um, who would be interested in speaking uh, to their um, experiences, perspectives and any advice that they have for each other uh, um, that could speak on a panel about this for next Wednesday. And if you could send me um, your name and your um, what you would like to speak about, I, I, I think this would be actually a very interesting exchange of ideas and information. Um, my email is ddr at ddrpr.com. So uh, like Dawn Dankner Rosen at Dawn Dankner Rosen PR.com. So DDR at DDRPR.com. And I hope to get a lot of um, emails um, and a lot of interest in, in uh, speaking and sharing ideas. So thank you. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. I know that we all probably could have spent three hours on this call. Um, I personally could have asked uh, 30 different questions of each of these panelists. Um, Dawn and Rand, uh, thank you so much for bringing us these incredible panelists today. Um, and if uh, anybody has any thoughts on future topics that you'd like to see us cover on these calls, um, we, Dawn and Rand, have done a fabulous job of finding um, some really knowledgeable experts to be able to address the community. Um, and so I want to thank you both uh, for doing that. And you know, please reach thank out to us um, with, with suggestions and recommendations for going forward.